Alrighty, well, good afternoon and thank you everybody for joining us today and we appreciate your patience as we resolved a little bit of a technical issue. Um, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library and I will tech be your tech support guy for the, the program today. Um, with us also today is Cindy Warwick who is in charge of our author talks and we'll tell you a little bit more about our presenter Rick Gefkin. Um, before we jump into Cindy's introduction, I just want to go through a brief overview of the GoToWebinar dashboard for everybody. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like. Um, if you do not see this, look for this orange button with a white arrow either at the top left or right hand side of your screen that will open and close the dashboard and it's possible that the dashboard loaded closed on you. Um, if you do not see us, or my screen, you don't see your dashboard, um, there is a blue snowflake type icon that you should be able to find either on your mobile device or on your computer. Uh, if you click on that, that, that icon, that should be able to bring up everything for you. Um, we do not have any handouts today, but if we are, will take your questions. So please uh, type them in the questions box here and you can send them at any time. Um, and Rick has graciously allowed us to, to interrupt him with any pertinent questions um, so that he can answer them as in real time as we can be um, given our current situation. So, um, and lastly, at any point, if you have any problems or running into any issues, there is a raise hand button here. You can raise that button. I will send you a message and hopefully we'll be able to resolve that. Um, so Cindy, take it away. Thank you, Andrew, I appreciate that. And welcome everyone today. We're glad that you can be with us um, for learning about New Jersey submarine inventors and I hope everybody as well. Uh, coming up, I wanted to tell you some of the topics of our webinars. Uh, we have one that's a part one and part two on estate planning boot camp. Um, I don't think it's as rigorous as like the Marines or anything, so don't be worried if you want to take that. Uh, finding grant funding using the foundation directory online essential is usually a very popular one. And uh, our librarian Lee Clark does a, a good job with that. And then we also have simple safeguards to stay safe from identity theft and cybercrime. So just visit our state library website and see all the events and the topics that are available there. And also, uh, I'm gonna plug our YouTube channel. A lot of times we have the, we are able to record the things. We are able to record, uh, Rick has allowed us to record today's session. So if for some reason you wanna go back and just rehear it, or you know a friend that didn't get to come today, same thing with our webinar topics. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, a lot of times is able to record those. So you can go to the YouTube channel. Next month, our author is, um, and I'm hoping I'm saying his name right, I actually have to talk to the gentleman one-on-one uh, -on -one to make sure I say his name right, is Delwar McLeod. I think I've got the right, the last name right, but maybe not the first. And he's gonna be talking about making the scene in the Garden State. It's a new book that just came out. His talk is about music in the Garden State, and it's from Edison. He covers from Edison to uh, like the jazz scene that was on in the, late 50s, early 60s, I believe, to Springsteen, of course, we can't forget him, and beyond. And I hope that you'll join us on May 11th at noon for his talk. Today, we're going to be hearing from a historian and author, Rick Gefkin. He's not a stranger to our state library programming. He owned and operated several small businesses. He's taught secondary school mathematics. He was an adjunct professor at Ocean County Community College and retired from a career with Hewlett Packard. He's also a retired U.S. Army officer and Vietnam vet, holds a B.S. in economics from St. Peter's University, a secondary teaching certificate from Monmouth University, and an M.A. in social sciences from Montclair State University. He's written numerous articles on various aspects of New Jersey history for local newspapers, magazines, historical society, and newsletters. He's presented historical papers at the New Jersey History and Historic Preservation in 2014 and 2015. He's participated in symposia for groups such as the Navasink Maritime Historical Association, and he's appeared on the New Jersey cable TV show, Family Historian. He's got a lot of different books that he's written, and they include the story of Shrewsbury Revisited. Uh, that's 1965 to 2015. Our talk that he did for us was Lost Amusement Parks of the North Jersey Shore, and he's got a book on that. Uh, he's got Gateway to the Jersey Shore and very many more. 
Uh, and his latest book, just published in January by the History Press, is Stories of Slavery in New Jersey. He's spoken about historical topics uh, in many, many places at dozens of historical societies and libraries. He's been a featured speaker at the Trent House Museum there in Trenton, the Quaker Meeting of Shrewsbury, the Battleground Historical Society, and other organizations. And he's a trustee of the Shrewsbury Historical Society, past president and a trustee of the Jersey Coast Heritage Museum at Sandless House, and a member of the Monmouth County Historical Association. He's currently heading up a project, he's a busy guy, called the New Jersey Slavery Records Index under the auspices of Monmouth University of West Long Branch, New Jersey. And so he's gonna tell us today about New Jersey submarine inventors. Thank you, Rick. We'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Cindy. And as you can all just hear, I'm a Jersey guy. And so we're gonna to try to talk about uh, some Jersey guys uh, today. So let's see if we can bring this up and whoop wrong one but sorry i've got the logo wrong can you can you all see that cindy no did did you get the notification to share your screen uh, hold on let me do that first share my go. screen okay all right we can so, see your <laughs> okay i actually did have the new jersey public uh, uh, the new jersey state library up there folks so you'll forgive me but the content uh, is going to be the same same. So we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, these two men, uh, John Holland and Simon Lake, and what they did for um, New Jersey, um, etc. So uh, hopefully uh, this next screen came up. And the question that I'm proposing for all of you is, who invented the um, submarine? Well, we've got a couple of candidates. Um, a lot of folks are familiar with Leonardo da Vinci, of course who um, was a genius in a lot of areas. And there's a sketch there you can see of what may or may not have been a submarine. Some scholars think it is. He never uh, perfected it or experimented on it as far as we know. And back in the 16th century, of course, he would have been limited. Um, perhaps a guy named David Bushnell in, uh, in the Revolutionary War era invented, is given credit sometimes for the uh, invention of the submarine. Um, and actually, probably the closest we're going to get to pre-modern, if you will, submarines was this guy, Horace Hunley, uh, during the Civil War. So we're going to just give you a little of that background. Um, here's the uh, David Bushnell so-called American turtle. And you can look at it on the left, and uh, it looks more like an acorn to me, kind of bobbing along in the water, uh, back to the periscope level. Um, during the American Revolution, he actually did uh, create this wooden, believe it or not, ship um, submarine, so-called. And on the right side of where you can see the operator, it was a one-man operation. He had a little screw device where the theory was to screw into the side of a British ship in New York Harbor, put some explosives in there, and uh, blow the ship up. Uh, it didn't work, suffice it to say, uh, and he almost drowned. Um, Fast forward another 80 years, and uh, Horace Hunley did actually put together what looks remarkably like a submarine, um, went underwater, and you can see from this illustration, I hope, that there was a crew of uh, nine folks. And the sad news there is, as they cranked that boat along to try to break the, uh, the Union blockade in um, Charleston, the boat sank and all hands were lost. Um, and that was more or less the end of Hunley's experiment um, a little side note, they did raise that artifact of a submarine 100 years later. Um, but we want to get to our Jersey guys. And our Jersey guys, uh, uh, we'll start with Simon Lake. And Simon Lake has got Jersey written all over him, uh, including the fact that he was the fifth great grandson of a man named John Lake, one of the originators of what was then called the Mammoth Patent uh, a land grant who came over early, uh, I should say, mid 17th century, bought land from the Lenape Indians, uh, did John Lake and these other men from Gravesend, which is in Brooklyn, um, and thus begins the Lake family saga in New Jersey. Uh, Simon Lake that we're gonna talk about was born, you can see right after the Civil War in Lakeville, they called it because it was founded by his family. Uh, his father, 
John was a um, noted inventor in his own right. He ran a machine shop. He invented that pull down roller shade that we all might remember from when we were kids. Um, steering mechanisms for other vessels, you know, ship ship going vessels, uh, sea going vessels, sorry. Uh, Simon's brothers, James and Wesley Lake, founded Ocean City. You can see on the map way down south, uh, not too far from where they live. Their cousin, Vincent, invented a typesetting machine. And his other brothers invented the Caterpillar tractor of all things. So Simon Lake comes from a family steeped in uh, invention and engineering. He was inspired as a young boy by, of course, Jules Verne. Um, and he became, Jules Verne, the French author, became his lifelong hero. Uh, these are various uh, images of the original uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, made into a movie in the early part of the 20th century. The one I saw as a kid, maybe a lot of you are familiar with, was the one on the lower left there, um, starring Kirk Douglas and James Mason, 1954. And then, of course, the classic comic version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And it's a classic story of a submarine uh, that, because it so enamored Simon Lake, he began to think about how he could create a submarine as a very young man. Um, as he's doing that, uh, early on in, um, I should say late in the 19th century, the U.S. government decides that as a military option, we need our government our military needs submarines. And they came up with a contest to see if they could have various inventors uh, come up with the design. And the design seems simple to say it, but you had a guarantee that it was safe, that it could submerge. Well, that'd be nice. Uh, that was reliably motorable underwater. It had speed and endurance, offensive power to be used as a weapon. Um, and oh, by the way, you had to give them a non-refundable check uh, of 5% of whatever your bid was to build this thing. Uh, typical government kind of initiative. Uh, one guy actually met all of the prerequisites to the contract. A guy named George Baker, as you see here, he had a, a wooden boat. He built it in Detroit. But for one reason or another, the government did not grant him uh, the winning entry into this submarine contest. Um, another entry was this guy, JP or John Holland, who, although he's associated now with New Jersey, was actually born in, as you can see, County Clare in uh, Ireland. But he was an aficionado of military history too and knew all about the Merrimack and the Monitor battle in the Civil War. And you can see there that the two ships in that image, by the way, neither was an actual submarine. They were ironclad ships built over wooden ships. But that inspired Holland. Um, when he moves to the United States in 1872, uh, he submits some designs to the federal government, uh, including uh, what he called the Fenian Ram in 1883, which he, uh, and here's his New Jersey Association, um, experimented with in the Passaic River and also New York Harbor, not too far from New Jersey. As a matter of fact, that original submarine is right there up in Passaic. You can see it outdoors or in a, in a museum fairly close by too. So at the same time he's doing that, our friend Simon Lake is submitting and had submitted this design, uh, which he thought uh, answered all the prerequisite to the United States government. As you may be able to see from the illustration, it had two hulls, one inside the other, kind of a pressure protector. It had propellers, five of them, not only forward and backwards, but what we now call side thrusters, so it could move. Yes, it had wheels, because the original submarine design from Simon Lake decided that we'd have to wheel it across the bottom of the ocean or the sea. Had a diving compartment to get divers in and out. It had a periscope, a revolving turret and a gun, four to torpedo tubes, and although he submitted the design, he never built it which may be one of the reasons the government never awarded these patents to anyone at, the, at that early stage of the contest. Um, not to be thwarted, Simon Lake moved to Atlantic Islands uh, from Pleasantville down south where his family was from. And he did it for a couple of reasons. One, his uncle had actually founded Atlantic Islands. He was a Methodist uh, minister. 
and two, because as you can see in the 1892 image there, Atlantic Highlands had a long pier out into what we call Sandy Hook Bay um, to accommodate, you can see there on the left, the ferry boats that were coming from New York. And so Simon Lake knew that he had a place where he could experiment. And so what does he do? He builds this ungainly looking submarine, okay? Um, uh, out Rick, of, um, yes. Your slides are off and that um, about the bottom third of the screen is the next slide. Okay, so I, let it, me see. It, it might be the, the viewer that you're using to, to share them. Let me see if I can fix that. Sorry for everybody. Um, is that any better or is it the same? Uh, that appears to be the, the same. All right. Sorry. Oh, uh, boy. Okay. Let's see what we can do here. What do we have up there now? Uh, now it's just a holding slide. Okay, we don't want that, certainly. We're going to try this again. Okay, let me fast forward and see if this is any better. All right, we're still getting some... Minimum, I'm not sure why. All right, try. I just sent you another request to share. No, I didn't get that. Sorry. Uh, I just sent you another request to share. Did that come up? Uh, no, it did not. Uh, let me pull down your, can you send it one more time? Yes. Okay, it says I'm sharing my screen. I don't know what you're seeing. Let's see. Uh, it's a white screen. All right, that's not good. Our apologies, everyone. We're going to get this right, I promise. Rick, if you need me to, you just have to tell me next, and I do have the program. So, it, I mean, I've never done this where I showed my screen, but I'm sure Andrew could talk me through it. So, if you need that, we can do can that too. Okay. okay. Oh, and you have it too, right? right let's Andy? see. Okay. I'm going to try to do this now and see if we can see where we are. And I'm going to do this. And all right, what are we seeing now? Uh, it's still the white screen. Andrew, can you hear me? Yeah, it's still the white screen. Oh, okay. Um, I can just load it on mine, and you can just let me know when to go. Yeah, why don't you do that? Just we're okay. sorry, everyone. Uh, please forgive us. The internet being the internet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's going to work a lot better. Okay. So bring me down about five slides, Andrew, if you would. Oh, much better, much better. Okay, next one we should, okay. We did that one, thank you. And here we go. All right, so there's Atlantic Highlands, we had the deep harbor. Um, Andrew, if you wanna forward.
Okay. All right. So here is, as I was saying, again, sorry if you need to rush in, what uh, Simon Lake did build, this 16-foot, 14-foot, a very ungainly-looking device. Uh, believe it or not, even though it was wood, he had it weighted with ballast, and uh, in fact, it did it did uh, submerge. So, Andrew, if you just hit it, he called it, okay, the uh, Argonaut, which is a scientific name for Nautilus, so he's giving tribute to um, his mentor, uh, James, uh, I should say, uh, Jules Verne. Um, you also know the Nautilus, perhaps, if you look on the left, that very ungainly looking kind of octopus creature. Next. Um, even though he called it the Argonaut Junior, which is kind of odd, uh, it was the precursor to what he later built that he called the Argonaut. You can see the image on the right, a real kind of modern looking submarine out of metal with the exception of the wheels. Next. So not too far from where I live, okay, on the eastern part of our state, uh, he launches with his cousin, does Simon Lake, this Argonaut Junior in what's called Blackfish Hole next. Uh, right there uh, between, on the right, is Mammoth Beach Seabright and a place called Hartshorn's Woods in Middletown uh, because it was 16 feet deep. Next. And when he launches it, looks like that today, uh, he, in fact, they're happy they submerge. They can see out of the little porthole they had built, and they think they have this wild success. Next. Um they go back in uh, the next year, in January 1895, they uh, put a big crew of newspaper people and the public together at the pier, uh, picture here in Atlantic Highlands. Uh, and they're going to demonstrate, whoops, yeah, there we go, thank you. They're going to demonstrate that the Argonaut Junior works. And what happens? They submerge it in front of the crowd. They go down. A couple of minutes later, they come up and they're showing shells and things that they got from the bottom of the of the uh Sandy Hook Bay, and the skeptics, believe it or not, New Jersey people, skeptics in the crowd say, oh no, you had those things in that submarine before you submerged, we don't believe it. And as luck would have it, the mayor of town took a, uh, a, a slate shingle from the side of a building there, scratched his name in it, threw it back into the harbor, Simon Lake and his cousin submerge again, they come back up with this um, slate shingle, proving to the crowd that they in fact had a submersible vehicle. And now they think their fortune is made, uh, although nothing, of course, is that simple. Next. Around that same time, John Holland is progressing uh, with his, what he called, torpedo boat company, uh, and wins finally a Navy uh, award of $150,000. And he builds the USS Holland, of course, up in Elizabeth. So again, he's an Irishman, but he's associated closely with New Jersey. Uh, and in Raritan Bay, he's doing experiments. Um, and he finally, the, the Navy finally commissions this ship, this submarine in October, 1900. This is crushing to Simon Lake, who thinks he's got better designs because he didn't stop at that wooden submarine. So next, and there you see a picture of John Holland and a crew uh, in Raritan Bay. Uh, 1898, actually, that's the USS Plunger, he called it, pretty obvious name. Uh, next one. And eventually, he builds this thing, and now he calls his company the Electric Boat Company, the precursor to a lot of submarine companies that wind up in Connecticut over the years. Next. Uh, unfortunately, Highland dies in the early part of the 20th century. As you saw, he, he's actually buried up in Totowa, New Jersey. Thanks, Andrew. Next one. So what does Simon Lake do? Not to be outdone, he keeps inventing and, and uh, you know, improving upon his designs. Here's the Argonaut. He gets uh, some pretty good um, publicity, in this case, in the New York Times. Next. And there is a more full-fledged uh, engineering uh, document uh, showing his submarine uh, that he patents. Um, he, he appears on the cover of uh, Harper's Weekly, so he's getting more and more fame. At the same time, Holland is still actively pursuing his uh, patents. Um, go ahead, Andrew. 
1897, there's the Argonaut. Again, the design was wheeled. It was going to wheel across the bottom. Next. And what he does is he brings this ungodly looking creation of his down to the Chesapeake Bay and he brings it and he and it submerges it and it does a kind of a publicity tour for the next 80 days coming up from the Chesapeake Bay, Baltimore area up to the Jersey Shore, stopping along the way, getting newspaper coverage of his invention. Next. When the word gets to Jules Verne in France, Jules Verne is enthralled that somebody came up uh, with this kind of a design. Uh, and he writes a letter next to Simon Lake approving of what he reads. And he th does something very interesting there. In this letter, if you'd hit the next one too, he says that your boat, the Argonaut, is evidence that this invention, this concept can be done. And he also uh, predicts, does Jules Verne, interestingly enough, uh, that the next great war would be a contest between submarine boats. Now, this is some years before World War I, but that is, in fact, what happens. Next. So Simon Lake finally reaches a point in time where people respect his designs. They understand that he is a, uh, an inventor of, of um, some expertise, um, but he's also a dreamer. And one of his lifelong dreams was that these boats could be used to salvage sunken treasure. Uh, here's a newspaper article showing a tender ship up top with a submarine down below to explore what could be found on the ocean bottom. Uh, next one. Um, in, a, uh, in a, another publication, um, they talk about the wreck of the new era. Next. And what that's about is a 19th century yeah, go ahead, forward it one more time. Uh, a 19th century, mid 19th century grounding of a ship bringing German immigrants over. It hits up on what is roughly Deal Beach in New Jersey now, but, but really has Bray Park area. Uh, it's a bitter cold night. Uh, most of these men and women immigrants jump overboard in an attempt to swim ashore. If they could see the shore, they drown. It's this disaster. Um, and uh, it actually is a precursor, another lecture altogether, Cindy, someday, on what becomes our life-saving service and then our Coast Guard in, in response to this. Uh, next, please. Um, there were so many bodies that washed up over the next couple of weeks in the shore uh, that, again, it led to the creation of our Coast Guard. And a monument was put up uh, several several decades later to these German immigrants. And ironically, that monument that was on the boardwalk near Asbury Park to uh, memorialize these folks that have lost their lives gets washed away in a storm, and it's never been seen since. Now, something this heavy, a stone monument, is my belief that someday, someday, when the erosion continues along the Jersey Shore, this thing will probably be uncovered again. Uh, next, thank you. Uh, another thing that Simon Lake pursues is the wreck of a boat called the uh, Her Majesty's Ship or His Majesty's Ship, the Husser, uh, during the Revolutionary War. Next. In a place called Hellgate, uh, Sir Charles Poole, who's in charge of this ship, ignores a local slave pilot named Bill who says, you better not go up this side of the river. Of course, the Husser uh, sinks on this rock called Pot Rock, sinks and allegedly was loaded with goal to pay the British troops during the Revolutionary War. Uh, Simon Lake gets the idea that he's going to go down, find the wreck of the Husser, proving to people that this is uh, another use for his submarine. Next. This is the result of that expedition. Uh, no one quite knows if that thing had ever been raised before or in fact, there was gold uh, on it to pay the British troops. But the whole expedition yielded about 86 cents worth of salvage materials to Simon Lake. But again, just an illustration of what a kind of a dreamer the man was besides a, uh, an accomplished inventor. Uh, next. However, by 1907, the designs are improving. Uh, of course, uh, John Holland's still alive. 
uh, submarines are here to stay. Under people understand it. The government certainly does. Uh, Simon Lake moves, opens up the Lake Torpedo Company up in Connecticut, and then, oddly enough, at the uh, uh, outset of what was going to become World War One, he designed subs for basically the other side, right? Italy, Germany, England on our side uh, eventually, Russian and Poland, because our government is enthralled by Holland's designs, not so much Lake's. Uh, but eventually, uh, after World War I, when submarine warfare is demonstrated as viable, uh, Simon Lake's company do does build a huge number of submarines for our Navy. Uh, in fact, um, he is quoted uh, several times, but at least in this newspaper article, as saying, uh, as being acknowledged as having designed a submarine for uh, England, which everybody thought was the best design of all. Next. And of course, all things uh, pass, including us folks. Um, and after probably 30 or 40 almost years of some acknowledgement and success, Simon Lake passes away uh, long after, uh, three decades after his most uh, famous competitor, John Holland, uh, in 1945. Uh, so he saw the result, did Simon Lake, of his submarine inventions, certainly in World War I, but most uh, surely in World War II, uh, and gets the due credit finally uh, as the kind of the father of submarine warfare. Uh, next one. But it took another almost 20 years before the Navy, in an acknowledgement to Simon Lake's uh, expertise, um, to name, believe it or not, a submarine tender after him. This boat, the USS Simon Lake, was uh, launched in February 1964, uh, saw action off the coast of Vietnam uh, during that war later in, that, uh, in the 1960s, early 70s. Uh, next slide. Um, and it was finally, oops, sorry, if you go back this one, it was decommissioned eventually in July of 1999 and sold for scrap. Um, but the, the tale here that we're telling is that New Jersey, uh, famous for so many things, uh, although all the research I did uh, in my life previous to this, I had no idea that we were so formative and important as a state with these two submarine inventors, John Holland and course Simon Lake. Uh, and the last slide, I think, uh, Andrew, thank you, is that uh, certainly at the library, and Cindy will tell you about, I suppose, drive by and how to get books out of the library, but certainly at your local libraries, you can, uh, and I would recommend looking at a few books. Uh, on the right is a book about John Holland and his life that I use certainly in this research. Um, on the left was uh, a book that, uh, and also in the middle, uh, books that Simon Lake himself wrote, one touting submarine warfare, and then his autobiography and how he came uh, to his inventions uh, to uh, bring submarine warfare for good or for ill around the world. So with that, and with apologies for the internet, um, I will open this up, Cindy, through you, if you'd like, to anyone's questions. Yes, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to send them in the, the questions box and uh, we'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, why did they move to Connecticut? Oh, great question. So um, after Simon Lake had um, experimented in the harbor in uh, Atlantic Highlands, where he had family, um, it was just not a suitable nor deep enough. It's only 20, 25 feet in some of the spots in San Diego Bay. It was not deep enough for what he wanted to do. And it didn't have necessarily easy access to the ocean. You'd have to go around Sandy Hook and then down a bit into the Atlantic Ocean. Whereas Connecticut, uh, where in Bridgeport, certainly, he was on Long Island Sound, which was deeper than Sandy Hook Bay. And also he could go around and also get into Atlantic Highlands. Um, I should say the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, I, I'd like to believe, too, that as he was making more money, he decided he was looking for a more tranquil place to live, and he picked a place on the coast of Connecticut as well. 
what was the 86 cents worth of treasure found? Do you know what it was? Yeah. Basically, yeah, basically scrap metal. Um, I assume that that headline has to do with, you know, he mounted an expedition for, let's say, $100,000, uh, but he, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, cost him that much. And by the time he salvaged everything and tried to get back to break even after he paid salaries and everything, he wound up with 86 cents. So it was nothing of any historic nature. And again, the speculation has always been that one, maybe the British, while that ship was sinking, offloaded any uh, any payments that they were going to give to their troops or that later salvagers that were lost in history unrecorded uh, got some of that some of that so-called treasure. But certainly Simon Lake never did. At what point did Lake abandon the idea of wheeled submarines? That's a great question. Um, sometime uh, early in the 20th century, uh, when uh, you know he he did actually have successful wheeled vehicles, but they're limited, of course. They're limited to the bottom. You have to be on the bottom. The bottom, uh, if you're in a sandy, smooth place, that's fairly good. Uh, if you're in a rocky place or a place that isn't so smooth, that's not so good. Um, but then it had to do with uh, the, uh, I would say, experimentation with ballast systems so that you just didn't need ballast to bring you down to the bottom and wheel around. Uh, you could flood chambers uh, with water or expel that water to make the, the submarines um, more floatable, if you will. So you, did, you weren't, you weren't um, tied to the bottom. So by his inventions in you know, the 1914-1916 range, uh, he abandons the wheel vehicle approach um, because he can now have this submarine, any submarine, uh, as did, by the way, Holland, um, you know, kind of float at will through the currents. Um, so wheel submarines are obviously impractical in the long term. Good question. Uh, can you give a brief overview of like the propulsion systems? And you kind of touched on this already by the submerging surfacing systems. So uh, I'm not an engineer, and I can give a very brief overview, and I would recommend certainly any of these books for probably more detail on that. Um, but originally in the in the Argonaut Junior, believe it or not, he had a little steam um, engine uh, powering powering the boat along the bottom. Uh, over time, of course, steam you got to have some venting. Over time, they when the gasoline um, you know internal combustion engines start to get perfected, they were putting those in. Uh, to the submarines, and then you'd have exhaust, uh, of course, of, of the uh, noxious gases, uh, but the engines could turn the propellers, certainly in the rear, and then side thrusters as they went on and on, um, and you would have fins on the submarines that could be like on an airplane, where you could uh, propel yourself up or down or sideways. Um, so it's a long, long process of, you know, years and years, decades, actually, of inventing better propulsive systems. Uh, along with that, you can't vent, um, you know, carbon monoxide from a gas engine uh, into a place where people are working and operating. So you have to figure out ways to vent that uh, out. Uh, so a very complex mechanism, some of which I understand, some of which I don't. Um, but um, it took a long time. And then by, as you all know, probably by uh, 1959, I think it was, the first atomic powered submarine, which, by the way, our government called the Nautilus as a tribute both to Simon Lake and to Jules Verne, uh, was uh, a nuclear powered sub. Um, and today, my God, uh, the submarines are, you know, many, many generations finer and smoother and more efficient where they can, uh, you know, stay submerged for months at a time. Uh, do these men have any connection to the Hunley? Or the submarine that was tested in the Rancocas Creek in Burlington County? That's a great question. Um, uh, I'm not sure of which submarine we're talking about. Um, I'm not necessarily an expert on every submarine. Um, the Hunley, uh, Hunley was, uh, a, a, if you will, uh, a Confederate uh, inventor uh, trying again to break the uh, blockade of the uh, naval ships in Chesapeake Harbor. Uh, the Hunley, that design I showed you before, that sank and was raised later. But as far as I know, Hunley himself, Horace Hunley, did not come up this way. Um, but I won't rule that out. I actually don't know. Uh, have you ever been in a working sailing submarine? 
<laughs> Great question. Uh, no, I wish I had. I did as part of my uh, in my lifetime endeavors. I was a scuba diving instructor, um, and I uh, did a lot of that or uh, various places around the world, mostly off the coast of New Jersey. Not unlike Simon Lake's goal, by the way, of exploring a lot of shipwrecks when I was a younger man and doing a lot of diving. But unfortunately, um, I never uh, submerged in a submarine. I may have been up in New London with my kids at one point. I think we did the tour up there um, and probably got on top of the submarine. But no, I, uh, I wish I could still. Um, do you know anything about the, the water-filled ballast tanks, particularly how was the water expelled from the tanks? So, I, you know, again, I'm not an engineer nor an expert on that. But when you fill, you know, the original designs, as you saw, frankly, uh, with uh, certainly Simon Lake, they put rocks in the bottom of this thing, you know, anything heavy to bring them down. And then you have to jettison those or figure out another way to get up. Um, ballast tanks, my understanding is, you know, they're big holding tanks. Uh, you have an intake port. You bring in water so you can sink. Uh, and then there must be some kind of mechanical mechanism, uh, depending upon the type of submarine and engine uh, propulsion that forces the water out uh, of, a, of another area uh, in order to lighten the submarine. Uh, but I am no stretch uh, a, a marine uh, engineer, so I can't tell you a whole lot more than that. Uh, but they must work to some extent very similarly, uh, no matter what the design is, even up to today. Uh, did Lake have any misgivings about the result of using submarines in warfare? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, my reading of Lake is that he didn't. And I think that was primarily driven by the fact that he was an inventor who spent, you know, decades trying to convince our government, particularly the Navy, of course, uh, into accepting his designs. And as you saw in the Jules Verne's quote, um, Obviously, some of those men were prescient enough to see that submarines were going to be useful in wartime. And so an inventor like, well, any kind of inventor who's creating for the military um, is looking at, uh, from an entrepreneurial lens, if you will, um, from a, a patriotic lens, if you will. You know, if you're going to invent submarines and your own Navy is going to adopt those designs, you want them to be successful. Um, I don't have any recall, but again, I don't know the man's entirety of his life, uh, that he regretted the obvious damage that wartime does to anybody. If anything, I would think that Simon Lake would see submarine warfare uh, at least more defensive uh, in support of our military than as a weapon of mass destruction. But again, I don't know the man's conscience when he was alive. Um, I don't recall any great regret that he had for his inventions. How did you initially find out about these inventors to get you interested in researching the topic? You know, that's, thank you for that, whoever asked that. That's a really good question. Uh, it's interesting, Cindy Warwick and I were talking before this presentation today about uh, research in general and, you know, how do you find things out? Well, um, when I retired from a career in the computer industry, oh, 10 years ago now, I had always been, I'm a Jersey guy, I grew up in New Jersey, and I grew up, frankly, um, spent summers in the Highlands, and I knew Atlantic Highlands. I don't have any recall of hearing anything about either Holland or Lake at that, at that point in time. But I was aware of things in Highlands, some of you may know the Twin Lights lighthouse up on the hill, and other things, so my history, uh, my concept of history was always there. So when I retired and got involved in various historic societies and started to speak at libraries like this, um, originally I was researching, as, as you may have heard mentioned, uh, amusement parks that I had recalled as a kid. Um, and, uh, you know, you go down rabbit holes of research and I found suddenly references to Simon Lake and Atlantic Islands that I knew very well as a kid. Um, and when I moved to Middletown, of course, it was the next town over. And I said, gee, I don't know anything about Simon Lake. Um, and, you know, began to kind of read it and read about him and research it. Uh, and then I came across Holland similarly. By the way, there's no relation of John Holland to the Holland Tunnel. That's an entirely different name, uh, but named after a per different person. Um, and um, I was interested, as I always am as a, as a teacher, hopefully, and a historian, of introducing important New Jersey events 
uh, and episodes to to everyone. And so what evolved was this presentation um, about Holland and um, Simon Lake. Uh, similarly, my amusement park book came out of my own personal experience with amusement parks like Asbury Park and those folks, uh, those kinds of places that all kinds of folks went to when I was a kid. Um, and then my latest book that Cindy mentioned, Slave, Stories of Slavery in New Jersey, I kept running across references to slavery in New Jersey, which I had never been exposed to uh, as a, uh, you know, I went to my schooling and education in New Jersey. I took my master's at Montclair State. I never heard about submarines in New Jersey. I never heard about slavery in New Jersey. Uh, and so these things just kind of come to the fore and I'm interested in them. And so uh, I put the, together these presentations. Uh, so thank you for that question. And, and by the way, I recommend to everybody because our state is, you know, uh, post contact, post European contact with the Lenapes, we have 400 years of really rich, uh, rich and deep history. Obviously, the Revolutionary War and all the things that happened here, uh, slavery as a subtopic uh, or maybe a major topic these days, uh, and all these other things, the music industry uh, that came out of New Jersey, uh, our unique geographic location and our, we have to acknowledge, our proximity to both Philadelphia and New York uh, positioned us to be this vibrant engine of, of social invention um, and material invention uh, and economics. So there is a lot, and the State Library in particular is a wonderful repository, not only of books, by the way, but their archives, of which I tap all the time, have tremendous resources for anyone who wants to uh, look into what I kind of think of behind the headlines of what we think we know about New Jersey. I will tell you, uh, long rambling answer, sorry, but I will tell you that virtually every day, mostly online these days, of course, I come across a mention of something important to New Jersey and therefore national and sometimes world history that I never knew. Um, so our state library is, is superb. Um, and uh, Cindy, I hope you're going to give a pitch for how people can find out things online as well. But thank you for that for that question. Ready? Well, it appears that is all the questions that we have. So, if Cindy, you want to take us out? Yes, I will do that. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for um, your presentation here. It is very interesting. I uh, am. I like to hear things that I don't know about New Jersey as well. I will give a little pitch for the State Library. I think Andrew actually could do it a little better than me being a librarian and, and dealing directly with the public. But um, we have wonderful stuff digitally. Um, you know, you can always ask a librarian, but our YouTube channel is growing. And if you're interested, for instance, in ancestry and genealogy, there's a lot of good things on there that start right from the beginning. If you don't know where to start, She'll tell you the difference, be, uh, Regina Fitz, oh dear, Fitzgerald, Andrew, Fitzpatrick? Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Thank you, Fitzpatrick. Oh, I just lost it. Sorry. And Regina, if you're listening, I'm really sorry. But um, that she's done, the, uh, she and Andrew just did a whole series of the difference between the state archives and the state library and, and the information that you can find there. So you're welcome to any time, while we're not open to the public, please send us a reference question. You can ask the ref desk, but you know, go on to those on our YouTube channel because there's just a lot on funding, on genealogy, on so many of our things. Visit our research guides because one portal takes you a lot of different places and will give you a lot of different websites with information and these have all been vetted so you know that you're getting the quality that is the New Jersey State Library. So that's my pitch. And uh, I was supposed to do it in 30 seconds, but I labored over the Fitzpatrick and Fitzgerald. So, Andrew, if you want to add anything, that's great. But thank you so much for coming. I hope you'll come back uh, to some of our webinars and maybe next time to hear our talk on the music scene, which uh, Rick was referencing. And um, so just come back and, and visit us. Thank you. And Andrew, Andrew, if I may, are there any plans yet uh, about reopening the library to the general public? 
Uh, unfortunately, we do not have a timetable yet, so. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your understanding with our little internet glitches today. Um, but as we all know, these things happen. And, uh, you know, uh, hope, hopefully uh, going into spring and summer now, we will get to the Jersey Shore, and you may not see a submarine. <laughs> then again, you might. You never know. All right. Thank you, everyone.